Good, good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. Welcome to the Middle East Institute. We're delighted to have His Excellency Dr. Saeed Muhammad Qasim Sajadpur with us this morning. He's head of the Center for International Research and Education under the Iranian Foreign Ministry. He is also the president of the Iranian Institute for International uh, Political and International Studies. He was previously advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs on Strategic Issues between 2013 and 2016. He has distinguished not, uh, diplomatic credentials. He was the um, ambassador and deputy permanent representative for the Islamic Republic of Iran to the United Nations from 2003 onwards. He received his PhD in political science from George Washington University in DC and was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. He has taught at the College of International Relations in Tehran University, Azad University, and Iran's National Defense University. Dr. Sajadpur was editor of the Iranian Review of Foreign Affairs and has published many articles. Some of these include Neutral Statements, Committed Practice, the USSR and the War, the Evolution of Iran's National Security Doctrine. And he's recently published a book, uh, just in March this year, entitled Transition in International Relations of the Post-Western World, which was co-authored uh, co with the Iranian Foreign Minister, Dr. Javad Zarif, and the Iranian Ambassador, Dr. Ibadullah Mullahi. So uh, we have a distinguished uh, guest and scholar who I am sure will um, enlighten, us, enlighten us on um, Iran's foreign policy, its various considerations, and hopefully give us some idea of uh, what we can uh, look towards looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. Can I sit here? Yes. yes. I think it's more friendly. Yeah. Then it would be more formal. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I do thank you and your colleagues in the Institute and of course our Ambassador and Ambassador of Singapore to here for bringing me to Singapore, which is the first time that I visit and it is so beautiful and uh, so uh, friendly. I really appreciate uh, being here and I do thank everybody who made this uh, possible. Um, just to start, uh, since in your introduction uh, you, you, of course, uh, rightly touched the diplomatic uh, hat that I have, but you know, I usually say I don't have much hair, but I have two hats. One is the academic, the other one is diplomatic, uh, and there is difference between these two. Uh, that means, of course, both are good but depends on the weather, you should use different hats. Uh, and when you are a diplomat, you should be very careful uh, with all respect to the ambassadors who are here. Uh, you should be very careful in your wordings and uh, your even a smiles, your lookings and so on and so forth. And I don't want to act uh, ambassadorially here and I want really to be more of uh, the nature of my let's say, work uh, on the scholar side. Usually, so what, uh, by this introduction, I want to say whatever I say today is my own. It is not a diplomatic or a political statement. And usually I say this by a joke. Uh, and in the United States, they call it disclaimer. Huh? I have to have my disclaimer by a joke. And the joke is uh, very interesting. Of course, I have a set of jokes on this. And jokes are allowed here in Singapore, yes, uh, because they are, they are universal. And the joke says, uh, if you ask a, a, a question from a general and an ambassador and a professor, what's the difference between, between these three on answering the questions? If you ask a question from an ambassador and you hear yes, uh, a general, and you hear yes, the answer is yes, because the general should be the right. If it is no, the answer is no. If it is maybe, that person is not the general. Hmm? But ambassadors, if you ask a question and you hear yes, 
The real answer is maybe. Hmm? If you hear maybe, the real answer is no. And if you hear no, that person is not an ambassador because they shouldn't be directly uh, being negative. And if you ask the professor, with all due respect to our good friends and uh, colleagues who are here from the university side, uh, ne professors never say yes or no. They say on the one hand is this, on the other is this, we need conceptual frameworks. Uh, so this is what I'm going today, today, uh, having a conceptual framework on Iranian foreign policy in general and with its region, uh, I mean in particular. There are many talks about Iran, but what I would like to raise in this conceptual framework is just answering one question, raising one question and answering it. How Iran is understood and how it should be understood? I think it's a scholarly question. How Iran is understood, in the other words, how Iran is constructed? We have a lot of discussions on an Iran which is constructed, and it is not the real Iran. It is an imagined uh, notion. It is a different depiction of reality. This is why you see a lot of uh, surprises always on Iranian politics, Iranian behavior, because the constructions on Iran are so many. Uh, so I tried to answer this question, well, how it's constructed, and how it should be understood. Very easy. In answering this question, I have uh, three uh, concepts, A, B, C. I have two A's, two B's, two C's. A, assumptions versus analysis. B, blame versus behavior. And C, containment versus cooperation. Let me go to each of them one by one. Assumptions. A lot of uh, books, articles, especially media, political pronouncements you hear on Iran, they start by an assumption on Iran. So they take Iran with a pre assume notion, and they construct the rest of their argument based on the assumption. Such as Iran is, let's say, is a danger. So they start by Iran being a danger. They, they look at nuclear, let's say, program Iran. Iran is uh, an expansionist you know, power. Iran is uh, very, uh, let's say, uh, suppressive uh, system. You know, all this, they start from this, and then the rest is in support of this assumption which has been taken as a proved, let's say, notion from the beginning. There are so many of them. We call it Iranophobia, but it is not one. And of course, I'm happy that I'm in Asia because in Asia it's less than the other part of the world. But in, we have globalization, but we have also globalization of notions on Iran. Iran is reviving its old empire. This is what I hear these days, especially in Turkey or in the Arab world. Safavid empire is emerging. Shia Sunni conflict. Persian hegemony, Iranian hegemony, Iranian occupation of, uh, let's say, the other political territories, Iranian medalism in the Middle East, I mean, and so many others about Iranian domestic politics. I think these assumptions do not produce analysis. Because when you start by, uh, from the beginning to me, oh, this guy, should be a dangerous guy. Why? Because he's bald, for example. Then your, the rest of your argument is rested upon a very erroneous notion which doesn't produce any understanding of me. I think uh, these uh, type of uh, assumptions are reductionist. 
and I think here everybody understands what I do mean by reductions. They reduce the totality of a complex society like Iran to single notions or concepts. Actually, once we had our, uh, we had Secretary General of the United Nations, former one, Ban Ki-moon, in our in school, a school of international relations, and I was moderating his, uh, uh, the panel he was talking, and I do remember he touched upon three concepts that the, U the West is using about Iran. Uh, terrorism, uh, human rights, and uh, being against peace in the Middle East. And he somehow criticized it. And in the end of his talk, he said, uh, of course, he praised Iran for its, uh, you know, for its uh, arts and culture. And he, uh, he, he said in the UN, we have a carpet, very beautiful one from Iran, uh, which has this uh, poem by uh, Saadi that Bani Adam that all human beings are the same. And it is, every day I see it, and also there is a portrait of me on a Persian carpet, which I really enjoy. And I told him, Mr. In when he finished, that Mr. Secretary General, you praise the Iranian carpets. Yes, and he said they are beautiful, but you know they are. Any Iranian carpet is made of millions of knots, millions. But at the end, they are beautiful. Iranian carpets are a reflection of Iranian society. It is a complex society, very complex society. And you cannot reduce the totality of a complex society to one single notion. It may be good for, let's say, political purposes, but for analysis understanding, I think it is not good to be reductionist. Reduction is against a scholarship. Furthermore, what you see this uh, type of uh, assumptions, I think they are dangerous. Why? Because they bring conflicts. A perpetual state of conflict. They are alarmistic in nature. And he always bring any player to a state of conflict. But what is analysis? Analysis is understanding. A good analysis requires a comprehensiveness of taking different factors into play. It requires different complexities to be simplified and understood. And it takes, of course, many information and data gathering, processing, analyzing. And I think that is what we should do, not just rely on assumptions. So from now on, if you want to understand Iran, let's deconstruct assumption from analysis. The second is B, blame game. Whatever you see, especially in the Middle East, they blame Iran for. They blame Iran for. And just a couple of days ago, this guy, this MBS, yes, M. Mohammed bin Salman, the, sec uh, the second uh, prince, you know, he talks so negatively against Iran. Uh, and he even rejected Iran from, let's say, by its totality, not just been pointing to one side of policy or the other, he said, uh, you know, the Iran is so and so, blaming Iran for everything. Uh, it reminds me of uh, my uh, studies in the United States during the Cold War. Uh, every, everything at that time, if it was wrong in international politics, there was a simple notion. Soviets did it, I mean, because it was easily blamed on Soviets. And I do, do remember a friend of mine had gone to a theater in, in Washington, D.C., and in the middle of uh, the film, uh, the electricity, you know, uh, is caught, and suddenly a teenager shouts, Russians did it, you know. Now everything in, in, in the Middle East is blamed uh, upon Iran. And it is used and reproduced. And I... To be frank, Iran is used as a blame, as a scapegoat for a lot of deficiencies. 
some of these Arab countries, I don't name, name them, they do have, they do have democratic deficiencies. After a century of rulership of some of these families, still they don't have a constitution. Iranians made two revolutions. 1906, of course, Professor Weiser is here, our professor of social history and political history of Iran, and 1979, two revolutions for political change. And today, we have in Iran today, uh, late in, in the evening, the second live presidential debate for the candidates. Everybody asks me what will happen to the uh, election. And my answer is, of course, I, my preference is clear, but I don't know what will happen, because when you have election, there is a degree of unpredictability. But have you heard any election in some of these countries? It is selection. But they cover their democratic deficiency by talking about Iran. Their efficiency deficiency. They are not delivering what they should be delivered. Even the security. If I, I have time, I will explain. Iran is the only country in that region which is providing its own security, producing its own security independently. We are not relying on any other actor for our own security. But the rest is highly dependent upon the others. But so they raise Iran for the deficiency because when they have the big enemy like Iran blaming for everything, uh, I think they can justify their policies. And I think blame game is not helpful in understanding. And what is missing in, in this type of analysis is what I call the behavior of the others toward Iran. What the United States has done to Iran during the post-revolutionary. 19, uh, 1929 Resolution of Security Council imposed the most difficult uh, sanctions on Iran for this assumption that the Iranian nuclear program may be so and so and so. On a pre-assumption, the most difficult sanction which was not imposed on any, co any country. Should, the, what type of be and the behaviors of the others in the region, outside the region, on Iran. Finally, let me go to, uh, uh, in this part on the sea. When you start by talking with assumptions, blame, the result would be containing of Iran. We have to contain Iran. And contain is a prelude to more even violent confrontation always. But uh, I think this is why you have so many harsh negativity in, in that region, vis-a-vis -vis Iran, or globally. But when you start by a good analysis, when you stand, understand uh, the behavior you, that it's not just Iran, it's the behavior of the others that should also be taken into account, then I think the issue of cooperation comes. And wherever Iran is accept, accepted, there has been cooperation. And I have to say, to report to you right now, Iran is cooperating bilaterally and internationally with so many actors on containing difficulties and issues and challenges. Bilaterally, we are cooperating with many countries on many issues, including with Singapore. Uh, we have an ambassador uh, who travels here. We don't have an embassy, but the same, we have a good ambassador. But we have areas of cooperation. I think today's meeting is the result of cooperation that exists between the state of Iran and the state of Singapore. At least it's a partial uh, differentiation between uh, listening to an Iranian from within or just depicting Iran by the imaginary notions from outside. 
but it is very simple. Go to the other issues uh, of uh, economic, uh, uh, trade, industrial, oil, gas, security. Look at what happened just yesterday in Astana. Iran, Russia, and uh, Turkey uh, cooperated for this, let's say, containing the conflict in, in Syria. Look at Iran and Turkey. We have a good cooperation. Yes, we have some differences, but huge, multiple-layered cooperation is there. It is so, uh, Iranian-Turkish relationship is so multi-layered, multi-dimensional, that even our differences on issues like Syria has not prevented us from deepening our relationship. With Pakistan, our uh, foreign minister was there just a, a day before yesterday. So this, these are the exam examples. With China, with Russia, with Europe. Now we have so many interactions with Europe. And I think this is because the starting point is not that we are dealing you know, with uh, certain assumptions. Even if you have assumptions, but you are ready to revisit it. I think that that would be a different story. Uh, I think with this A, B, C, let me a little bit explain for a few minutes on how our policies toward different regions shaped. Uh, is shaped uh, very quickly and be open to your question and answer and answer your questions, which I think is more important. How our po Iranian policy is uh, shaped toward its surrounding re regions. First, geography. Geography is very important. It's not all ideology or all the past. It is very important. You know, Iran is is bordering at least five regions and is not a part of them. Iran is bordering the Arab world, but it is not an Arab country. Iran is bordering Eastern Mediterranean through Turkey, but is not a Mediterranean culture or a Mediterranean country. Iran is bordering Caucasia through Azerbaijan and Armenia, but it is not a Caucasian country. Iran is bordering Central Asia through Turkmenistan, and some people argue about Afghanistan, but it's not an Asian, a Central Asian country. Iran is bordering Indian subcontinent, but is not a subcontinent country. So this unique geographical position gives us Iran a lot of chances as well as challenges. Geographically speaking, can you imagine any of these regions have any problem and Iran is not affected by that problem? Or can you think of solution and Iran not be part of the solution into these uh, diverse regions? And can you reduce Iranian uh, surroundings with only one country, one issue? Arab world by here is a scholarly place for the Middle East. The Arab uh, Middle East is divided to different subregions. Persian Gulf is considered one subregion. It is a little different from Iraq, which is of different subregion, and Levant and the other. And Iraq it itself is composed of three parts. Uh, or three, let's say, ethnic uh, and religious uh, communities. Shia in the south, Sunnis in the middle, and Kurds in the north. And there are one, some countries who just border with one of these parts of Iraq. Sudis are bordering just with the south, Turks are just bordering with the north, and Iran is bordering with three of them. So I think, look, if you want to understand the Iranian regional politics, you should be paying attention to these diverse geographical and geopolitical layers, and it's, uh, let's say, uh, ramification on policies. This is why Iranian policy in all of these regions are not the same. The Central Asians, Caucasians, and 
subcontinent and Arab world, you know, are different entities. So you, you can talk about different Iranian regional policies because the logic is, is very different. The other point I have to mm, mention on, on the regional level, there are building blocks for each of these regions. They have their own logic. In, with Afghanistan, we have three million Afghanis in Iran. Three million. And if you want uh, to see how they have been in Iran during the last 40 years, because of the Soviet invasion and the war, and they, they are still coming. And they are, I, I, Iran is not like Pakistan. Pakistan in the beginning, I think they put them in, in certain areas. But in Iran, they were mixed with different uh, uh, people in different cities. And uh, it's a huge, let's say, domestic issue, a cultural issue, money-consuming uh, issue, and so on and so forth. Also, it's positively contributing to the Iranian economy, I have to say. If you are analytically speaking, you have to take into account in, in, in that regard. So uh, each of these files have different components and different building blocks. Furthermore, there are different histories to each of them, different social backgrounds to each of them, and complexities in decision-making vis-a-vis them. And I don't want to go to the details of Iranian foreign policy decision-making, but I touch upon it and then finish. You see, for Iran, foreign policy is very important. Why? Because the Iranian revolution had a motto like French revolution. You know, these days we have French uh, debates also. They refer to the mottoes of French Revolution, Equalité, Legalité, and Liberté. I think these were three. Uh, now we had also Estaglal, Azadi, Jomuri, Islami. Estaglal means independence. We were not colonized directly, but we were subject of a lot of intervention for two, three centuries. So we are very sensitive to independence. Here I have to open a quick, short file, that in Iran, if you want to understand the complexities, you have to understand the, what I call mega social debates in Iran. During the last two centuries, we had five, six, sometimes seven mega social intellectual debates. Still, they are alive. One is about passionness and identity. To what extent are we passion? What does passionness mean? The second mega debate is about religion. To what extent are we religious? What type of religion? How pre-Islam and after Islam can be combined? What type of even Islam do we have? Then we have the mega debate on liberty, civil rights. We made a, a, social, a constitutional revolution based on this notion. Then we have another so, uh, debate, very tough these days especially, on economic development, advancement, growth. These days we talk about religion economy. We have another social debate on justice. And finally on independence and security. And any, any political party in Iran any social movement in Iran touches upon this. As you see, one of them is directly foreign policy oriented. Why there was so much talks on JCPO in Iran before and after? Because it touches upon the issue of independence. And the others also relate to foreign policy in a way or the others. Economic advancement, can, be, can it happen with cooperation of the others? or not. It should be inwarded or outwarded uh, economic strategy. Uh, and I think this complexity relates to the surroundings also. With the Arab world, with the uh, greater Middle East, West Asia, Central Asia, 
I think you have different complexities. This, these, these were the, uh, let's say, mega social debates, but we have institutions, individuals, issues, personalities are, are involved. So what I want to conclude is just distance a little bit from the simplistic notion of an alarmistic uh, uh, view that Iran is a danger by simplification of a selective, let's say, issue, and take a more comprehensive, complex picture of the realities of Iran. I'm not saying that we don't have challenges, we don't take mistakes, we don't have everything that we do is, uh, you know, uh, is excellent. When you are ambassador, you have to say everything is excellent. Hmm? Uh, or, of course, you have to, to be very defensive. I don't want to get to the side of defensive line, but I'm proud of, of course, my country as an Iranian individual or any Iranian who is attached to Iran today. But what I'm talking about is actually this question, how to understand Iran. And I think the understanding of Iran cannot be based on assumptions. You have to deconstruct assumptions. You cannot, it cannot be starting by blame game. It cannot be started by just talking about containment. On the other hand, it requires detailed, meticulous data gathering, uh, data processing, making observations, and trying to understand the complexities of, of a nation which is not new to that region, and which is very fundamental to peace and security of that region, and is for peace and security and for cooperation. I hope what I provided was a conceptual framework. I, end, I started by a joke on uh, differences between uh, ambassadors, generals, and uh, scholars. I don't know to what extent I, st uh, I uh, uh, stood by my scholarship, but uh, let me end by another joke, which may be more interesting. The joke is, say, what's the difference between a, a camel, an ambassador, and a professor? Uh -huh. It's a joke, of course. And the answer is a camel, since you are all exposed to the Middle East, you know the concept and uh, an animal called camel. In some areas, they have not seen a cam camel. A camel can work for a month and not drink, and nothing will happen, huh? Because they are able to work and not drink. An ambassador, of course, is a joke, Mr. Ambassador, can drink for a month and not work, huh? <laughs> and nothing will happen. And, of course, professors can work, drink, have conferences, conceptual frameworks, analysis, and nothing will happen. Thank you very much. <laughs>
we'd been invited to the library. And I was amazed at the thousands of books that were there. But there were, I think, 10 or 20,000 were in English and in European languages. And that, that, that impressed me, but that also educated me as to the age of the country that we now call Iran. We, of course, were very happy, uh, were very happily received, and uh, we spent a week there. The best fruits in the world we found was in Iran. In fact, we bought so many, we put it in the bathtub in the, in the hotel so we could eat it every morning or afternoon. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to ask about this particular great library that you have yeah. and the uh, universities that you have in Iran. Very good. That must have expanded. Oh, it's to expanded. I will report to Iran. Thank and you. I just wanted to, to say that. And I'm very happy that you're here. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your... Uh, can I ask? Yeah. I think what you saw uh, 38 years ago is uh, uh, incrementally changing Iran, and that, that is education. Actually, education is so important in Iran today, and uh, uh, especially higher education. We have about, I think, 4 million and 700,000 university students in Iran today. About 100,000 uh, PhDs in all fields, including hard sciences in Iran. And in terms of English, uh, this is my very personal. I'm not making, bringing uh, data from other places. I, annually, I teach a course uh, at the Faculty of uh, World Studies at Tehran University. It is in uh, a, a PhD level for American studies. And uh, the, course, the whole course is in English. Of course, the language in Iran is Persian. But it's exceptionally in English. Uh, and so, and the course, by the way, is on Iran and the US relationship, which is very fascinating in terms of a scholarship. But I'm personally impressed by the level of English that these students who have never been abroad and who have learned the total English in Iran and the efficiency and the vocabulary, the, let's say, and this is very impressive, and especially I'm impressed by my, my female students who speak much better English. I don't know why, but uh, right now, 60% of Iranian university students are female. And actually, there's this uh, French sociologist, I forgot the name. He has even done a research uh, under the title of Feminization of Knowledge in Iran. But uh, this is a, a reality, and they are everywhere. And I think right now, literacy rate in Iran is more than 90, it's around 95%. But what's Im impressive is the increasing level of uh, uh, university studies. Uh, there are, of course, some criticism that on the quantity, but we cannot all blame the quantity there are some qualitative uh, students. And um, here I'm not to blame the others, but this is what I have gathered and I've seen. You know, there are some other countries in, in, the, in our surroundings. Uh, they are very open to international companies. Uh, and they have also youth employment problems. So they have made some laws that if you are a foreign companies, company and you want to work in our country, in the Arab country, in our neighborhood, you should hire this amount of our graduates, the domestic graduates. And these companies want to hire, they get the exam from them, take exam and they fail usually because of the education system there is not good. And actually this is my knowledge that they, these companies say, yes, we hire you, we give you the money, but don't come to work because of, you know, paperwork. And some people who join um, uh, Daesh and ISIS are from this group who feel they are 
let's say, graduated, but they feel they are not taken seriously, and uh, they don't have financial problems at all because they are paid. But we have a university in Iran called Sharif University, Sharif Industrial University. If you are graduated from there, you are immediately either hired by international companies or you are given admission by American, best American university. So I think education is a serious issue in Iran and serious business. And it is, of course, due to the revolution, but it is also an Iranian, let's say, value. Uh, it's a Persian, let's say, culture that always has appreciated, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the concept of education. And actually, there is a book written by an Iranian Jew, uh, originally, called uh, Education and Making of Modern Iran. So you see that uh, uh, and he illustrates how deep is the concept of education in the culture. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Fanan? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sajatpur. Um, if you would allow me to ask you a three-part question. And you if may you have three questions. Don't worry. <laughs> and if you'd allow me to ask them under the assumption that you're wearing your scholarly hat, not your diplomatic hat. I and hope. I hope you don't ask difficult questions. Let's see now. <laughs> um, and politically loaded question. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I, certainly agree, I certainly agree with what you said about the simplifications that are inherent in commentary on Iran. Um, and our inheritance, sort of the commentary on the crises that are enveloping the Middle East, and sort of are all blamed on Iran, the hegemonic Iran, the expansionist Iran, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, having said that, um, I'm sure we can also agree that there are issues that do need to be addressed, and Iran's role has not been entirely benign in places like Syria or Iraq. And some would charge that Iran's role in Syria and Iraq has uh, contributed to the, uh, shall we say, weakening of the sovereignty of these countries by, for example, the fragmentation of their security apparatuses, which is something that Iran has directly contributed to. Now, I would submit to you, sir, that this is something that is not just a threat to, Syria, to the future of Syria and, and, uh, and Iraq, but is a future to the region, including Iran. It's a double-edged sword at best from an Iranian point of view, I'd say. So whilst we should avoid the blame game and these crises are far too big to be blamed on any, any single actor, yes, yes, yes. I would like, my first question is, I would like your, your take on Iranian policy in uh, Iraq and Syria. Actually, just two questions, Iraq and Syria, yeah. The, the second, or maybe perhaps the third, according to your question is, um, it seems to many that to resolve some of these issues, some sort of an understanding has to be reached, not just within the countries themselves, such as Iran or Syria or Yemen or Libya or what have you, but that some understanding has to be reached amongst the major powers in the region. Here I'm particularly thinking of Iran and Saudi Arabia. Yep. In your opinion, what is standing in the way of progress towards some kind of a detente between Saudi Arabia and Iran? What would you like to see uh, take place uh, with regards to that? My final question is, uh, do you feel that whatever progress was made in U.S.-Iranian relations under Obama, uh, whatever progress was made then is now perhaps threatened under a Trump presidency, or do you think that uh, there's no such threat? Very good. Good question, you. actually. And you are originally from? I'm from London. London. But you should have an Arabic uh, background. My name is Farah Haddad. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Middle Institute. Yeah, because I wanted to use an Arabic uh, proverb, which says, Husn al nisful ilm. A good question is half of the answer. So you, uh, if you ask another time, it would be a full answer. Uh, 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 very good question. Questions. On the first question, I'm happy that you brought it, Iran and Syria and Iran and Iraq, because it was one example that uh, you framed based on assumptions that Iran is uh, trying to, let's say, weaken that the states because of, uh, by uh, working with uh, groups there. But look, sir, uh, it is not Iran which is weakening Iran, Syria and Iraq states by supporting some groups. First of all, in, on, in Syria, Right now, everybody knows, 
that it was Iranian policy, which was not it was Iranian pronouncement and public statement four years ago that these groups that you support are not freedom fighter. They are terrorists. They are terrorists. And you cannot make freedom by employing these groups. We were very clear, simple with our neighbors on this issue. These groups cannot bring freedom and liberty. They don't understand. And, but they didn't listen, listen to us, anybody. And the outcome was ISIS. Uh, s furthermore, we, if we were not in Syria, Damascus would have fallen to the hand of these ISIS people. Simple. Can you imagine Damascus controlled by ISIS? You can imagine if it was not Iran, and of course, I'm not uh, taking all the cake for Iran, but this is the position. Furthermore, directly to your question, Iran is there on the invitation of the Syrian government. Syrian government, you may hate it. You may not like it, but it's a member of United Nations state. It means that internationally it is recognized. Furthermore, all these interventions were for regime change from outside. You mean they were trying, still are trying, to change a regime by, under the cover of uh, supporting this group and this group. I'm not saying whatever happened in Syria was right and whatever everybody did is, is defendable. No, I'm not talking on that line. But I want to go to the specific questions that you raised, that we are not like other Arab states or neighboring states of uh, Syria who try to support these militant groups and the outcome you see. In Iraq, the same. In Iraq, I think you mean Hashto Shabi, huh? Hajj Shabi is right now a part of legal Iraqi frame. It was passed in the parliament, and actually Turkish uh, president two weeks ago attacked Hashto Iran is the, with exactly the same question. And it was not Iran who responded. Uh, the, Iraqi, the Turkish ambassador to Baghdad was asked uh, to the Iraqi officials, and he was explained that Hashto Shabi is a part of Iraqi security apparatus. No, 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 no. I'm answering your question. I listened to you co completely. And I told you, if you have political loaded question, you can have your political statement. But if you have a scholar question, you have to listen carefully because a scholarship comes with patience and detailed knowledge. You see? But it's very easy. You say Hashto Shabi is so. Hashto Shabi is uh, Or Syrian has done so. Look what uh, Barizani said when ISIS was close to Erbil. He called for everybody for help, but no help came immediately, within four hours. It was Iran who helped uh, preventing uh, Erbil to be fallen in the hand of ISIS, this so-called Islamic state, which is not Islamic and it's not a state. Actually, it was an organization supported by some of the groups, uh, countries, players in the region. So look uh, from a deta detailed knowledge perspective, uh, these two cases, first of all, are the byproduct of other uh, issues and uh, development. But Iran has certain concerns, security uh, points, and so on and so forth, and Iran is aware of what it's doing, and it is in the help of the concept of a state, and it is not weakening of the state. On the second question, Iran and Saudi Arabia, it is not Iran. You cannot find any, any Iranian statement, as you heard two days ago from Saudi statement. It is on the record, not once, twice, many times, that we are for for the taunt, if you want to use uh, that word, for reducing the conflict. And I give you an example which you can go and check today. Our foreign minister was in Munich in February. And uh, 
uh, it's very interesting uh, to, I, because I was there and I, I watched from within what's happening in that conference. There were four speeches from the region, because it's not just about the Middle East, it's about everything. From uh, uh, Foreign Minister of Iran, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. And uh, it's interesting, the rest, these three, uh, were about, uh, of course, Turkey to lesser extent, but the rest, the, they were totally about Iran, as if there is only one problem in the Middle East, and that is Iran. All pronouncement, that this is that, all blame, all assumption, you know, you, you can go and check. But it was only the, uh, the foreign minister of Iran who, first of all, distance, they had a distance from this type of pronouncements. But more importantly, he said, we are for resolution of conflict. And he even offered a solution which may be interesting for you to hear, by bringing a format which is a very comprehensive, in a way is uh, face-saving, and it is very good. And that is Resolution 598. You don't know what's Resolution 598 of, yeah, this is the scholarship, the detail. And actually it's about operative uh, paragraph number eight in that resolution. Resolution 598 ended the Iran-Iraq war. Iran, it was passed in 1987, I think, uh, and Iran accepted in 1988, and it was the base that Iran and Iraq uh, accepted ceasefire and the war ended. And that is under chapter seven. In the operative uh, paragraph number eight, it talks about, the, actually it gives the mandate to the Secretary General of the United Nations to organize a regional meeting from the leader of the states of the Persian Gulf for a regional security arrangements to be discussed. So it is very vividly there. Not because I'm Iranian, I was impressed by the way that Iran approaches and the others are approaching. I think, uh, uh, Furthermore, I have to tell you, this is my personal reading. There are some people in, in those uh, literal states of the Persian Gulf who really even want to provoke Iran for more confrontation. But Iran is not for, Iran is not responding to their provocation. Of course, we defend, and we are not begging also for, let's say, detente. So we are not begging for better relationship. We say we are ready for a good relationship, a neighbor relationship, there is a frame, there is a reference, there is a time, and uh, we are ready for negotiation, for discussion, and so on and so forth. We think it is good for the region, it's good for in an individual region. So if you want our responses, clear. actually you said you are from UK, I received a, uh, an invitation more than a year ago from a very distinguished British uh, center that they want to organize, uh, you know, a type of track to on Iran and Saudi Arabia for resolution of this conflict and so on and so forth. And I know them from a long time. And I said, look, first check with Saudis. Are they ready? If they are ready, then we will, you know, uh, review and take into consideration. And I still I have not received the email. On the, your third question, uh, during Obama, it was not Iran-U.S. relationship in particular. It was in the nuclear file. So the Iranian policy was to separate this file from the totality of Iran-U.S. relationship. It may have created some confusion for the others, we were not negotiating with the United States per se. It was a multilateral format, again, based on a UN resolution, which authorized five plus one, that means five members of United Nations Security Council, plus Germany, plus uh, EU, 
uh, to negotiate with Iran. So the issue of Iran-U.S. is very complex. But I think Obama had a different notion of the Middle East, not just Iran, uh, which is nuanced by Trump. Uh, on Trump, I think uh, still, I was talking actually with very distinguished uh, scholar diplomat here today before coming here, Mahubani, and we talk a little, uh, about international issues. I was impressed by him. But when I talk with different scholars and read and follow, I follow the United States from Tehran every day, read Washington Post, New York Times, and uh, listen to NPR and others. So I'm not behind the American politics, but what you see uh, is the first time that you have a phenomenon in the United States. It's not just a personality, it's a phenomenon, uh, which I think is uh, exhibiting a very uh, high degree of uh, ambiguity, you know. What is the policies of Trump? You have seen a lot of fluctuations, ups and downs. Can you reckon upon a certain policy? I, I don't know from outside. But I want to report to you one thing. That is very good to take note, which I referred in the beginning. Uh, you know, I said Iran is, de is not dependent on its security on the United States, uh, on any uh, other players, including the United States. So it gives Iran a sense of being self-confident that it can manage, not uh, just vis-a-vis -vis United States, but vis-a-vis -vis other players. And the resultant effect of this is that we don't, we don't care, be it Obama or Trump. We are not like some who were shocked by Obama, who were very hopeful by Trump, and who may not be shocked again by Trump or hopeful by, by the others. Because it's the lesson of Iranian revolution that you should depend upon yourself. Now we have an election. It's a tough election. I have to say it's a tough election. Uh, and uh, the debate that I watched last uh, Friday uh, was not an easy one. And you know, we started these live debates uh, just in a decade ago with a lot of uh, uh, challenges. I, uh, and, so, and actually, I think UK uh, started a couple of years after uh, live debate after Iranian debate after seven centuries of democracy in the UK. So it's very complex. But what's important, we don't have a pro-American faction in Iran. We don't have a pro-Russian faction in Iran or pro this. Iranian politics is purely domestic. Iranian economy is also trying, uh, by the concept of resilient economy, we are trying to have uh, not just self-dependency in the, let's say, uh, old uh, uh, style of being connected from the world. No, we are trying to have a, a strong economy which is even in the wording of the document, is outward looking, but highly dependent upon its own uh, sources, which we call resistant economy or resilience economy. So if Trump is there, Obama is there, Kushner is there, senior, junior, uh, yeah, I think Iran is Iran, and Iran should be looked it, uh, at it not as an ap appendix, or attachment of the other policies. This is my response. JCPOA, what Trump is going to do, we don't know till now. They have stood by the uh, commitment of uh, the previous administration. What will happen? It depends on the future, and we will see. Yeah. Thank you. A question, Hi, uh, my name is Leon Musavi. I'm from the University of Liverpool based here in Singapore. Um, and I'll, I'll just say at the outset, because I think my question is related to my own kind of identity as both British and Iranian dual national. Um, so I've been to Iran a few times and I've been with foreigners, uh, non-Iranians to Iran as well. And I think what you said is, is very true, which is that there's a big mismatch between people's perceptions of Iran 
and what Iran is, is like and what people experience it to be. And the Iranophobia, as you called it, is, is really strong. So I think a lot of people around the world who've not been to Iran think Iran is a very kind of like dangerous place and a place where there's lots of, I don't know, aggression and, and people are very miserable and so on. But people who go to Iran, I think it's hard to find somebody who's been to Iran who's come out of Iran saying, it's just as bad as I thought. People usually come out and say, actually, it's a wonderful country with wonderful people and food and culture and history and um, academia and all of these kinds of things. So I think that kind of Orientalism that you identified is very, very much true. But I guess um, what I also would like to mention, and, and I guess that this, this comes from being like British and Iranian, is that what bothers me about when I've given talks in Iran is that sometimes I feel that there's the reverse process happening, like a kind of Occidentalism, you might want to call it. They call it Occidentalism in reverse, actually, mm. yeah. Mm. Where, you know, people sometimes, because my area of interest is about Islamophobia in the West. Exactly. So when I've been in Iran, I've been talking about, you know, there's Islamophobia in the West and people misunderstand Islam and Muslims and so on. But then I'm kind of like cautious because I also want to say in these talks, but listen, it's not everybody hates you and it's not everybody's against Iran and everybody is ignorant and the West is a terrible place and it's full of corruption and we should be very wary of the West. So I guess like if we really want to have a, a true like dialogue of civilizations as it as you might call it, we need to not only sort of challenge the Orientalism and the Iranophobia, but how about the Westernophobia? Do, do, do you think that exists in Iran? Do you think that's a problem? Do you think more needs to be done to enlighten people to the fact that there are allies and there are positive things within the West? It's not just a place of corruption and, and evilness. Thank you. A very good question, Ari Musavi. Very important question. Uh, and I appreciate it, uh, truly, because uh, it's it is a deep uh, issue, uh, and actually I have to say it's also a debated issue. I will explain. First of all, what I want, uh, my first response to you is, as a students and a scholars, we have to avoid generalizations. I think generalizations would be an ethmo to any authentic thinking. Iranians are like so, Singaporeans are like so, Arabs are like so, and I think uh, all phobias relate to generalizations. And so we cannot generalize uh, uh, the totality of different countries, different civilizations, uh, with uh, one single concept. And uh, it is true that uh, there is a correlation between uh, broad generalization and simplification uh, and uh, uh, different types of phobia when it comes to race religion, social class, and so on and so forth. Uh, the second is, of course, in Iran, you have a diverse society. When you have uh, uh, different people, you cannot say all Iranians think exactly the same on, on, on the West. Uh, so we have different, uh, let's say, notions, uh, different philosophical discussions I have to say, this is a debate also uh, uh, on, on, on this. Actually, we have several centers which study the West, Marquez Rafshinosi, Master Rafshinosi, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, but the third point is when it comes to the level of imperial policies, the West is the West. You know, what we look in, in Iran, look at the sanctions. Yeah, sanctions were supported by everybody again. It was against the people of Iran. Or when you look at before revolution, the overthrow of Mossadegh, you know, in 1953, which was actually first a British uh, move, which brought, you know, Americans. So it was an Anglo-Saxon project. So the history of Iran has enough uh, evidence of this on the political level. But what you're talking, I think, is my fourth question is, not just politics. You are talking about the social level. In the social level, I agree with you 100% that there is a diversity in the West. Actually, it's not in the West. I, uh, uh, I have some courses I teach, and I say even we don't have one Europe. We have an Anglo-Saxon Europe. We have a Francophone Europe, a German Europe. We have Southern Europe, Nordic Europe, and Eastern Europe. And I have to say, 
in relation with Iran, they differ from each other. The high degree of respect you get in Poland, if you say I'm Iranian, is not comparable with any other places. The reason is two. One is we have 450 years of relationship with Poland. Second, Iran was hospitable to Polish refugees during World War II, thousands of them. I visited Warsaw, Warsaw last year. I have visited several times, but last year I was impressed by a memorandum, a, a statue actually they have made of, and there is a plug there in Persian and in, in Polish identifying the Iranian contribution to Polish refugees in Iran. So I think there are different layers at the social level, and there are anti-war peace movement in the West, which is not just criticizing the West on Iran, but on its hegemonic <laughs> desires. But I have to end that in Iran, there are nuanced understanding emerging on uh, the differentiation between these uh, type and Iranian social science and political science communities are contributing in terms of translation, debates, and so on and so forth. When I go back to Tehran uh, on Sunday, I have to participate in a panel on evaluation of Trump in during the last 100 days and so, and I'm sure from the beginning that it's not only one reading. There are different readings in, in that panel that I will count. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Javanta Shetley from the Institute of South Asian Studies in the same building here. Yes. Um, Your Excellency, you spoke about uh, new initiatives for cooperation in the region. Yes. In fact, when the Indian Prime Minister visited Iran, there was huge optimism in India about a new chapter of relations between yes. India and Iran. I'd like to take advantage of your presence to have your comment on the progress and the problems in this relationship and the, particularly the status of the Chabahar port, please. Thank you. I think the hope is there, so the chapter is not closed. First of all, the chapter is open, and I think it's continuing. First of all, on Iran and India, I have to say it's an old relationship. It is a very structural, culturally bounded uh, relationship, and it's deep, and it goes beyond daily politics. It goes to the civilizational level, civilizational link. Uh, but to be very contemporary, I think uh, I was actually in India in January for Rising a conference organized by Observation, Observer Research Foundation in which President, um, Prime Minister Modi uh, uh, opened the conference. So I saw from within there, especially uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, feeling about Iran that was very positive. He referred to Iran in his opening several times, including uh, Chobar, and we hosted uh, a bilateral uh, uh, discussion with Indians just two, three weeks ago, so I'm very updated. I have to say uh, the, relation, uh, the issues uh, and the agreements that we had signed uh, this, uh, uh, for Chobar and the rest, it's not just Chobar. Chobar is a component of Iranian Actually, it's a component not just of Iran and uh, uh, Indian bilateral relationship, it's also Afghanistan. So it's a trilateral, but, uh, and it's going on. Uh, as I heard from the ambassador of India to Tehran, it's going on. There are some technical issues for finance of a railroad, which is also taken care, but the project, I think, is incrementally going on. There are some political pronouncements about uh, the, these type of cooperation between Iran and India, but you know our relationship with India is not uh, defined against any other nation. So it's a, an ongoing relationship, a positive one, and I'm thinking, uh, if you want my, as I said in the beginning, my response is that the chapter which, is, which was opened is opening up uh, incrementally. But if you want a radical shift, I think these 
cannot happen when you have projects because projects take time, you know, to make a, a port, to make railroads, uh, you know, finances should come uh, in different elements, different parcels of this, relation, uh, this project should be finalized. But generally, it's a very positive one. And JCPO also contributed to it because JCPOA, before JCPOA, there were issues of sanctions, but after that, I think this was uh, removed. Yeah. Any other questions? So it means they were convincing enough by answers or they were sleeping enough? No, I'm joking. Yeah. No time. Well, <laughs> perhaps uh, I may um, ask you a question. As, Please. Uh, I'm not sure about myself, but to you as an academic, because maybe I've heard one hand and I'd like to see the other hand. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just ask you. Um, a simple question, you, you, you have said that independence or istiklal is very important yeah. to Iran. And you have also said that although Iran was not colonized, it has been subject to at least a century or more of, yeah. in, of interference. And I think that is very true. We all know the history from constitutional revolutions, Mossadegh and so on. And I would say I would include the um, 1979 revolution. Um, which I think is not so different from many revolutions, especially, say, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution. Once you have your revolution, the other countries around you who have a different system of government get quite scared and become quite aggressive to the revolutionary uh, state. So clearly, after Iran had its um, revolution in 79, then immediately after that, you had Iraq attacking it. So I think that is very clear that uh, Iran has been on a defensive position. Uh, but over the years, then Iran, I believe, has built itself up quite well. And as you say, today Iran is uh, quite strong. We don't care whether it's Obama or Trump. We can take care of, of ourselves. We are the only state in the region who produces its own security. I think those, uh, those uh, are striking uh, observations. Um, so I, I'd like to ask you where you think Iran is today. I would say that Iran is much stronger today than it was in 1980. It has built up itself uh, very strongly. We heard from our uh, visiting professor, Dr. Ali Ghassari, that Iran has moved from being 80% rural society to 80% urban society to 80-95% uh, literate society. So Iran has, uh, today, is completely different from Iran in 1980. Yeah. Uh, I would also add that recent events, such as the um, downfall of Saddam Hussein, the um, civil war in Syria, uh, in a way have been free gifts to Iran, which have indeed strengthened Iran's position. The American, uh, basically, deposition of Saddam, their own client state, essentially uh, strengthen Iran's hand almost without Iran having to do anything about it. It was like a free gift. Syria, uh, the same story. After the fall of Gaddafi, I think uh, people went ahead of themselves to move on to the next project, which was, which was Syria. So I think Iran has, um, has um, you could say, had its hand strengthened by these recent events uh, without having to do that much. So my question to you is, uh, what is your assessment of Iran's hand today? How strong is that hand? Is Iran still a revolutionary state which still needs to defend itself against all comers? Or has Iran reached a certain level of self-confidence that it can uh, be in a position to, let's say, act from a position of strength with some grace to change the external environment in a different way, not as a revolutionary state under threat, but a state confident in its own power and able to uh, act from a position of strength. Are we there yet or are we not there yet? And I would say that one indicator for me, I don't, I'm not an expert in Iranian politics, 
but I know many Iranians from abroad, one indicator for me as a non-expert is simply to listen to the experts who I take to be the Iranian diaspora abroad. And I would say that the question of whether Iran has normalized or not, I take a simple measure of that to be whether the Iranian diaspora is ready to come home or the degree to which they have come home. I would take that as an index. So uh, thank you for your response. Very good. Uh, I think your question was a very educated, uh, detailed one. It had some assumptions, uh, some assessments, and uh, contrary to what you said, you proved that you are an expert on Iran. But uh, let me uh, uh, go to different layers of it. Uh, I think a uh, few points on your question. First of all, what is happening in Iran, what has happened, where Iran is, has a domestic dimension. And domestic dimension is what I call modernization from within. That's a very important sociological point. So Iran is modernized from within. And this modernization is real. And it's not imposed. We had imposed modernization before. Uh, we had authoritarian modernization, many type of authorization, uh, <laughs> modernization. But I think this time, uh, this modernization, we, uh, it has come not with easy cost, I have to say, but you see uh, it is happening uh, in an incremental but solid way. Urbanization that you mentioned, education, uh, I have to say globalization even, uh, of different sort, uh, comes within this package. If you visit uh, Iran, you see it's not a, a, a society with just one dimension. Even if you see, see a city like Qom, which is a religious capital, it is very complicated in the number of uh, Institute, the research institute, they work on different issues. Uh, so the modernization, the processes in uh, different debates. Actually, what's impressing about this election for me as observer, I'm not Marxist at all and I don't belong to this Marxist, but for me it's interesting that everybody's talking about economy in this debate. For me, it's, it's a sign of modernization. Because now they identify the problem. When you identify the problem, then you debate. Then you don't have just an imposition of certain uh, solution, which is uh, ideologically driven like uh, Marxist. I think then you will find a national solution. Now Iran is uh, debating itself uh, in this election, harshly, I have to say. But I think I see it as a sign of modernization. I think there would be something out of this, as we have debate. If you don't have debate on any issue, if you are not a debating society, you don't make progress. So my first response is Iran is modernizing itself from within. Uh, second, I think Iran uh, is uh, self-confident enough, uh, but it has not just been uh, achieved easily. Even what you mentioned, Iraq, as a gift. Yes, of course, Iraq was invaded by Americans, but uh, don't forget that we had a war of eight years with Saddam Hussein. We were saying that this guy is not trustable, he is aggressor, nobody listened, finally everybody listened. And, but Iran hosted these refugees, Iraqi refugees, Iraqi diaspora, if you want to call it, for almost 25 years, 30 years. They never thought they would return to back to Iraq. But what happened, the hospitality of Iran uh, being giving them, uh, let's say, access to Ira Iranian society, Iranian economy, in some part of Iranian markets, the Iraqi immigrant made a good wealth, I have to say. Even in, let's say, in some uh, 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 commodities like jewelry and gold, uh, they, they become very rich in, in Iran by doing so. When Iraq collapsed, 
or before collapse, this, it, it, Iran was the only country. It had some, let's say, preparation. I was in Erbil three years ago, and I was impressed in Erbil, I mean the uh, Kurdish part of Iraq. And I was impressed that everybody that I talked with is able to speak Persian. I was shocked, everywhere. And I told two other, two other Iranian professors who were with me that be careful, everybody knows Persian here. Uh, don't uh, talk you know, in bad language as well. So this was a joke. Then I asked this question from a very important man in the international relation of the party, Kurdish party who is ruling Kurdistan. I said, why everybody is talking Persian here? And he said, let me tell you a fact, that before the collapse of Saddam Hussein, courts, that means these people, uh, Shia Iraqis who were against Saddam Hussein, we were talking about the future of Iraq in Salahuddin. Salahuddin is the city of Iraq with Americans. And the American uh, negotiator was Zalmi Khalilzad, who was ambassador uh, to uh, Kabul first and Baghdad later. The, and he said the future, the negotiation in the future of Iraq was done in Persian because the only language that these people can talk was Persian. Uh, by this, uh, I want to, to report to you that it didn't happen as a gift. Iran was there and it was not easy. But look, uh, what has happened in the Middle East uh, during the last 25 years. Of course, some of them has helped Iran, like the collapse of Soviet Union. For three centuries, there was asymmetrical relationship between Iran and its northern neighbor, that was Russia and Soviet Union. This asymmetricity changed to the benefit of Iran in a strategy speaking. Uh, collapse of Saddam Hussein was unimportant, but you shouldn't forget uh, though we were against uh, the American occupation, but we were before anybody else on fighting with, uh, you know, uh, Saddam, on, and we made a lot of sacrifices. What happened during the last few years in the Arab part of the Middle East relates to one single concept, and that is this, the, let's say, weakness of a state in Arab states, in Arab countries. So the states, and actually one of the reasons that some of the states were weak, because they were blaming the others for their own deficiencies, including Iran. They use always the pretext of Iran, oh, Iran is a danger, and so, so forth. But they were not able to make a strong state. And this is why you see the, almost the collapse of a state. It is not collapse of just regimes. Uh, the states, uh, of course, it's not 100% in every place, but it is there. And uh, uh, I think Iran is somehow different in that respect from there. But, but your final, your fourth and final point, revolutionary or normal state. I think here there is a, let's say, um, a, a, a type of uh, uh, misleading a statement which was originally pronounced by Henry Kissinger, and then it was produced and reproduced in literature. He said, we don't have any problem with Iran as a state, but we have problem with Iran as a revolution. And uh, uh, here comes a fundamental point that all states, with no exception, have ideals and ideals which they attach to and they defend including United States. Isn't United States a still a revolutionary state? Huh? It still it is. It is believed to be the shining uh, light huh, on the hill. Of course, I don't know with Trump what will happen, but it's still this belief that we are able to do so. So you cannot find any state which is not attached to an idea. Where that idea comes, either it's a revolution, the United States made the first revolution. It was even bef before French Revolution. 
If you read the uh, American Revolutionary Statement of uh, 1776, you are impressed by the uh, identical, even wordings that we use in Iranian Revolution, including tyranny, you know, a word which is frequently used there in the Revolutionary Statements of American Revolution and Iranian Revolution is tyranny. Uh, so uh, you cannot find any state with, uh, without any attachment to an ideal or idea or value and so on and so forth. But if you translate these ideals and values with intervention in the other places, militarily speaking, by taking over the other places as the Soviet uh, revolution did, I think it, it would be erroneous, but you cannot ignore that a still French revolution is live. And I think you have heard this famous uh, statement by Chuan Lai when he was asked, what's your view on uh, French revolution? He said two centuries is not enough to gauge the impact of a revolution. I think he was true in, in one respect, but uh, still you have these ideals. So Iran, is attached to these ideals, but it doesn't mean it, it should be equated with militaristic approach, with intervention, with uh, you know this type of uh, expansionist policy at all. So it is erroneous to equate Iranian revolution with this. Actually, a still Iranian revolution, I think, is very defensive. Iran is a still defense. Look at the literature. You are here at the research center. Do a research tomorrow or tonight, today. See how many big books and, lit and articles have written on security of Iran. First of all, it is few. Second, mostly it has written from the outside perspective. And third, nobody has looked at Iranian security concerns. That this country also has security concerns as a state. I think uh, Iran has not invaded, has not uh, initiated any war during the last two centuries at all. During the recent post-revolution time, we have always been in defensive. And what you hear, if you hear anything else, tell me, sanctions, containment, military option is on the table. These are the pronouncements of we destroy, we do this, we do this. Is that it is violent verbal statements or or real action. So a city is on defensive, and Iran doesn't have any territorial uh, claim, any territorial wishes, and so on and so forth. But if you mean by ideals, yes, we stand by uh, our independence. Independence for us is very important, clear, and we are have to say very jealous about it. If we read a statement which is uh, even giving the impression that our independence is not and taken seriously or is marginalized, we respond, uh, we defend it, maybe we defend it very uh, strongly. But I have to go to your la last point, diaspora. I think uh, I've been Iranian uh, representative to International Migration Organization, IOM, in Geneva, and I've written on migration management uh, several articles and I've taught on this issue. First of all, a part of migration is a global issue. It is not an Iranian issue per se. Now I think about 100, more than 170 million people live as migrants in places where they are not born. So you cannot allude all this diaspora to Iran. Yes, a generation of them, uh, maybe 30 years ago, uh, 35 years ago, uh, migrated due to revolution and to war. But the influx of migrants uh, don't, uh, uh, I mean, not, not all of them relate to revolution. Second point is, the now Iranian diaspora is well established outside Iran. And, uh, it would be very difficult for them to change the place again, financially, psychologically, and so on and so forth. So they are established and they are doing it. Third, the majority 
have no problem in going, I think the absolute majority have no problem in going back to Iran, and they do so. I mean, if you want to see the number of flights uh, which come to Iran f full of this diaspora, uh, look at the number of flights coming from different European capitals, and so on and so forth. But what is considered to be normalized by a diaspora who is living in the United States for, uh, let's say, 35 years, 40 years, may be different from what is normal by an Iranian. So there are different cognitive, let's say, issues, but there are always indices and criteria, and I think that is the Constitution uh, which sets the, the agenda. There is a debate also, and I have to say, finally, uh, on the issue of diaspora, in Iran there is a high degree of understanding for them uh, at different levels. Uh, even there are talks that they, it's not uh, that, uh, let's say that uh, talk is not mainstream, but uh, they see they have to have more representation in Iranian legislati legislative processes and so on and so forth. Now Iranian diaspora finally is a part of Iranian community. And now Iran is very globalized by this diaspora. And this diaspora has been contributing to the Iranian culture globally. And they resisted Iranian sanctions. And I have to report to you, they were number one activists in defying this uh, Trump anti-Muslim ban. Uh, and uh, maybe this can be my final word, I think Iranian diaspora is as nationalistic as Iranians inside. I may add that some of them are even more nationalistic than Iranian inside. So Iranian national nationalism and Iranian identity is so strong. It is not a fabricated uh, product of this decade or that decade. It is so deeply rooted. Actually, once I was writing the speech of of her former ambassador to the United States, uh, to, uh, to United Nations, 20 years ago, talking uh, when President Khatami was coming there. And I wrote and uh, this statement, and he read, of course, that whenever, wherever Persian is spoken, and wherever Iranian culture is appreciated, is part of Iranian cultural zone. And I never forget that Iranians, Iranian diaspora who were there, were so uh, happy about the st statements they praised. So I don't see that much differentiation between Iranian who is inside and outside uh, when it goes to the Iranian identity and looking at the frames that they both attach to. Thank you, thank you. Well, this, oh, we have many more questions. Okay, um, I was gonna say that uh, we are saving the uh, toughest for the last, but it's not the last. We'll have a few more questions. Uh, yes. Professor Ali Gesari. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a comprehensive assessment, uh, more ways than uh, three <laughs> which you initially uh, promised. And on the last point, of course, uh, 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 the life of the diaspora, and sort of Iran included, not just Iran. Uh, they have a mental abode and a physical abode, and I think uh, you uh, uh, touched it correctly. Uh, back to the mindset of dependency uh, following the revolution and uh, the years beyond the end of the Iran-Iraq war. Um, and in spite, I've been mean, going back to uh, Professor Ensing's uh, uh, apt question, to what extent Iran is a status quo regime, and to what extent it's, you know, it is you know, revolutionary. Part of that question is maybe uh, home-based, but in good measure it is also a kind of position which yeah. is Iran has been dealt with, that had to be dealt with. So going back to uh, your very important uh, I mean, observations on uh, where we are in terms of the current debates on the elections, when you define the question, uh, uh, it's quite quite important in terms of uh, uh, you know the current assessment and the question being the economy. Now the mondo operandi is under Iran operates under sanctions, and psychologically Iran has been very uh, uh, defensive 
on how to cope you know, with sanctions in more ways than one, official, unofficial, parallel, etc. Uh, and European economies, especially after six plus one last year, uh, were quite eager uh, to interact with Iran on that. Um, the fact of the matter was that there was some cash which is gradually being unfrozen. Everybody was hoping to cash in on that, basically, not long term. Uh, the setback being that, you know, sort of a larger green light was not forthcoming, mm. N namely the whole Western sort of economies uh, led by the U.S. And we are not anywhere different, it, yeah. in a sense, uh, since uh, since last year. Uh, and having touched in your in your talk uh, on uh, uh, not only the merits but the realities of globalization that Iran is uh, uh, interacting with. Thank you. Uh, is there a debate that Iran should look more into Asia uh, mm. in terms of its economic uh, uh, prospects, potentials, and uh, interactions rather than just um, hoping to you know, please a very you know, willing range of European companies but being mutually frustrated, A, um, not getting the bring, sort of a big green light, and B, you know, not being sure that what Iran thinks about the foreign trade. I mean, Iran, you know, to the best of my limited knowledge, is that there is no, con uh, co uh, uh, not comprehensive, but consistent understanding of the ethos of Iran's foreign uh, you know, commercial portfolio. Uh, is it a sort of state-run economy? Is it a private economy? Mm. To what extent we are depending on SWIFT? To what extent we can bypass all by ministerial ordinances and so forth, which for the business sector, I mean, these are, you know, you're moving, sort of operating on a moving target. So I thought if you would see okay. any you know, prospects of dealing more, I mean, looking more into Asia, Southeast okay. Asia rather than uh, Europe. Thank you very much. Should I answer? Yes, please. You want <clears throat> very good question. Thank you for your comment and question. I think uh, on uh, your question has different layers, uh, uh, if I want to touch all of them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but I, I think uh, the thrust of your question was on the Asian orientation. Uh, yes, I think there is this uh, debate on Asia, but it's not new. I mean, it's not because of the responses of uh, different European companies uh, and Americans to, to Iran. There is a, a strong debate that, first of all, it's not just Asia. We have to diversify our sources of economic interaction. I think this diversification is the key. It means Europe is important, Russia is important. Now our economic interaction with Russia is increasing. Though it is not to the level of, you know, uh, let's say what is aspired for, but it is increased 60%. And I think it's interesting because you see, for example, when we say uh, it economic interaction has uh, been increased, it means it has different components. I was impressed in Moscow. You know, I visited Moscow several times during last year and so, uh, and uh, previous, in not this previous, the two uh, visit back. I was walking in uh, for a couple of hours. We had time to walk on, in Moscow Street, and my colleagues from the, the embassy uh, it brought me to Ar Arbat Street. You know, Arbat Street, very famous. It's close to, it is downtown Moscow, beautiful place, uh, very old and ancient buildings uh, are there. And there is a street full of uh, what you call the uh, shops which sell these, uh, uh, you know, flags, monuments, uh, uh, those uh, touristic items. And they told me now this. Uh, Russian uh, tourist shops, they speak Persian uh, because we have a lot of Iranian 
tourists going to, to Moscow, which is very novel, you know, in, in the Iranian. Or you see Georgia is book becoming a, a destination of uh, economic, uh, economic interaction with Georgia is increasing, or with Afghanistan. Uh, so diversification is very important. And here, China is very important. India is becoming very important. Uh, I think uh, other Asians, South Korea, Japan, uh, they have always been important. Actually, what's interesting, JC made some of them more happy than Iranians. I mean, Japanese, they really, they are eager to have better relationship economically with Iran. Because if you study Japan-Iranian relationship, there has been always an appreciation of Iran in, in Japan, going to a century ago even. So there is no anti-Iran sentiment. First of all, in Asia, totally, compared to what you see in, in the West. And to the, in individual countries in Asia, you have a sense of appreciation. So this diversification is is there, and I think it's going to be more with South Korea and with other major players, with even us, us on at large. Uh, but it is not due to JCPOA. You know, J because your question here was the trick, that JCPOA, I think, opened up a lot of locks, you know, that were in Ir Iranian international trade interaction, and they were positive. <coughs> Some people were over-expecting. This was the problem. We were expecting for immediate investment from, let's say, European and these Western companies. I think it didn't happen and it should not have happened because it's still it is not even two years. But the psychological mood has been changed. I was in Brussels just a month ago. I was invited for a conference just on JCPOA, and I was impressed. Because there were 30 people invited, paid full by a German think tank in Brussels. And the, the topic was JCPOA. And the message was that Europe stands by JCPOA. And they were even saying that we would challenge Trump. Because it's not an American, uh, let's say, uh, agreement. We are there and we, we have to. This is what we hear from. And it is a part of what I say, unlocked barriers that, that we have seen. So uh, diversification is the response to your question in the continuation, further in the continuation of Iranian uh, Asian uh, outlook uh, uh, also should be added. Furthermore, I think generally Iran is taking Asia more seriously, not just on the economic side. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sajatpur. We are actually out of time, but we will have just one last quick question from uh, Dr. Sirkan Yolajan, and we will uh, then, with your answer, conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to go back to the question of uh, Iranian diaspora, but reduce the scale from the global to the regional. Uh, Iran shares uh, populations with countries around it. So you have the Kurds with, uh, yes. sh shared with uh, Iraq and Turkey and Azeris with Azerbaijan, Armenians, even a small population with Armenia, Baluch with Pakistan, Afghans with Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and if we step down from the level of high politics to the social interactions across the border, yes. we see a, actually a very vivid social landscape. Yes. So um, despite what we might imagine uh, as sort of Iran being isolated and so on, Iran is, is very much in, 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 uh, in a close relationship with all these countries sure. through these populations yeah. moving. In specifically in Turkey, for example, because of the uh, visa-free uh, travel, you see uh, thousands of uh, Iranians coming in. You also have uh, uh, Shia Turks in Istanbul sure. going uh, uh, to for Iran Mashat, yeah. for uh, pilgrimage or al also education in Qom and so on. You have Azeris going back and forth uh, through the border uh, uh, in the north. So do you, does the Iranian state um, have any uh, a sort of broad framework as to how to engage these sorts of uh, interactions and, and capitalize on them uh, maybe more politically. Recently we saw 
the case between Ahmadinejad and, uh, and Erdogan, actually these sort of diasporic connections becoming a matter of high politics with yeah. the money laundering in, in Dubai and, and the gold transfer and so on. So um, can you comment on it uh, very briefly? Thank you. Uh, very good point that you, you raised, uh, you want to keep us here because it's in the core. You touched uh, several issues which require attention. But I tell you that what you brought to the picture is a very important issue, which is not that much politicized and should not be politicized. It is about people to people. And what is missing in the understanding of Iran today is this type of huge people-to-people -people interaction, which is happening between Iran and its neighborhood. And it's not exclusive to what you said, per se. Right now, there is a huge people-to-people -people interaction between Iran and, Pak and Iraq. You know, normally, 1.5 million Iranians visit uh, Iraq every, every year, but we, along with this, we have two, three more millions more for Arba'in, you know, this special uh, demonstration or walking demonstration from Iran going there. And one million point uh, two uh, Iraqis with Iran. This is a huge number. For Iraqis, it's, but they don't come just for one purpose. Iraqis come for, of course, pilgrimage. They go to Mashhad, but they go for, they come Iran for what we call medical tourism. It's cheaper, it's more uh, advanced in Iran. They go also for recreation, because uh, you know, what the point they like is the north of Iran. You, know, the, you have now an Iraqi, let's say, tourist coming to the north of Iran. Azerbaijan that you mentioned. I was in Azerbaijan last year, and I was impressed. You know, Azerbaijan has totally 10 million, Republic of Azerbaijan, I mean. 10 million people. Do you know how many? annually visit Iran, one million. It means 10% of population of Azerbaijan visits uh, uh, Iran, 10% uh, of the totality of a country. That's huge, huge number. Afghan is, is, is a different story. If you go to Harad to Iranian consulate, you see lines for getting Iranian visa there, which is very impress impressive. But what's interesting is this, there cannot be one general policy for all of these issues. Case to case, they differ. But Iran as a state, I think, appreciates this people-to-people -people contact because of economic reasons, social reasons, and the more people are connected, the better relationship exists between these nations and uh, the, uh, let's say, positive independence, psychological independence, economic independence, social independence, is really contributing to peace and security. Thank you very much, Professor Sajapur. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. We know that Salat uh, awaits you at lunch uh, at the Bar Alwi Mosque, uh, where we have uh, no sectarian problems <laughs> in uh. Singapore. And um, thank you so much for being with us, thank and you. we're happy to host you on your first visit to Singapore, and we hope there will be many more in the future. Thank you very much. I also enjoyed it so much. <laughs>